Well, thank you one and all for tuning into our show. As always, we want to ask you that you give us a thumbs up. We're going to imagine you're going to like the show and find the content uh, worthwhile. And this is a very relaxed show. It's very much like we're just sitting down, the three of us, and we're having a cup of coffee together, maybe a bite to eat. And we're just kind of discussing ideas and thoughts on how people can deal with this rapidly changing world that is frightening many, causing huge amounts of confusion. And when people are frightened and confused, it doesn't create a pleasant lifestyle. So I had the great pleasure of interviewing Mike on my last show. And as we dug into it, the topic of autism came up. It's an area in which I have a, a, a great interest because my granddaughter is autistic. And that's a whole nother show just to go into what her life is like. And she's gone on to uh, teach uh, profoundly physically disabled deaf children. And for some reason, her autism allows her to relate to these children like nobody else can. She's like a, a, a deaf whisperer that these kids can relate to her like you can't imagine it. It's on, But she has a hard time relating to me, <laughs> for example, or, or to her mother. So that's a whole nother topic we might cover part of uh, on the show today. So what I would ask is everyone, please do give us a thumb up. Please do subscribe. Please send your friends as someone we could interview. A lot of my shows are on specific backgrounds of people, but it's not about their background. It's how you can use whatever you have learned in life, rising to challenge, to help solve problems, help other people feel good. So, Mike, would you be kind enough to introduce yourself, give them just that snippet in case they missed the first show, and then introduce your friend, and then we'll just turn it into a, a conversation. Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Amesha. I'm the sales team's manager over at Cloverleaf uh, Financial. Um, I also work with Emma Rourke here, my BCBA. She's my supervisor on the at the autism clinic that we work at, uh, at uh, the Autism Home, Home Health Support Services. Uh, I always get that a little confused when I try to say it. Um, but, uh, you know, I've learned so much and, and what it's done, we talked about it obviously on our last show, we, you know, how even the skills that I've learned with working with my son in autism, how it's helped me with business and, and leading and, and with my company that, you know, um, I learned a lot from Emma, you know, she doesn't know that because I really haven't said that to her. So, but over the last, you know, eight months, you know, even her leadership style and how she manages us is I, I've been very impressed by it. Um, and so I thought that she'd be, a, you know, do great, be great to you know bring on here because she has a wealth of knowledge about, uh, you know, this particular topic and how, you know, what I've learned, I'm sure she could take it to another level on explaining how, you know, a lot of these practices and the stuff that we do are not just for autism. It can be applied to a lot of different areas. Yeah. Thank you for the kind words, Mike. And I'm actually excited to hear, I know you in a work aspect, but I'm excited to hear more about your personal life and your son and, and why that brought you to us. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, I, when when Colin was born, you know, I, I had learning disabilities growing up early, and I saw very early on when Colin was born some of the some, some of the stuff that I saw in myself, and you know, I I started to adapt as an apparent, just trying to adjust, but I just knew that Colin was a little bit special uh, in a, in different ways. He's unique and and and, and amazing, and so. You know, how life worked as this goes on, as we, you know, finally got him tested and everything else, I started to get really intrigued because I really wanted to know more on how to help him and be, you know, as I'm understanding autism, it's a big support system, you know, everything at school, at home, friends. And when you're out like this, it's a, it's a, a really big group effort. And uh, I was looking for more to, to do and I wanted to, I'm really big on like self-growth and, and, and taking on different challenges and tasks and, you know, that's how I ended up going, you know what, why, I didn't realize that with my background that I could get into this. I, I did, I just didn't know. And so when I found out that I could actually, in fact, you know, get involved in, in with autism and, and the capacity that I do now, um, you know, I went for it because I knew that it was going to be an unknown for me. It was going to also, I felt, help me be better for my son at home you know, and, and his life and those things, you know, brought me to you, you know, how I'm coming here was I wanted to, you know, I, this was kind of like a, a multi-purpose uh, thing for me, a transition. I love that. And David, just for your, the background on 
Mike and I's history Please. and relationship at work. Um, I actually had the privilege of doing his interview too. So when he came to us, I remember walking out of that and Mike, I've never told you this, but um, walking out of that and telling the the rest of the team, like, holy cow, this guy is so passionate about not only caring for his son, but being able to learn more about ABA and being able to hone his skills in that realm of his life so he can be better for his son. And you could just see your passion walking out of there. So we are so lucky to well, have you and happy you, you came around. Well, thank you. That really means a lot. That really does. I, I really take this stuff. There. I am very passionate about this stuff. And, and I'm glad that you guys gave me the opportunity. I was really scared. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it was, it was a very terrifying experience beginning because I just didn't want to fail. You know, I wanted to make sure that I was doing the right things. You know, it's very important. And um, so that means a lot. Thank you. It really does. So, Emma, what attracted you to this field? Uh, I think on our, on our pre-show talk, it wasn't like you you thought, oh, here's a field I should go into. You had really no idea. How did you end up going into it? Yeah, so ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, is what that stands for, is actually a very new field. Um, it's We're still a baby as a field, and um, it wasn't very widely spread until about the probably the last 10 years in the Midwest. Um, California was the first to adopt lots of laws surrounding it and, and see it really widely used. But I grew up in Ohio. I finished schooling in Ohio. Um, and that was one of the last states to adopt insurance reform for ABA um, funding. And I actually, I, I had no idea what it was. I ended up, like I told you, at a clinic that served the population of kids with autism and they they had an ABA practice going and I was actually there for occupational therapy so I wanted to go in into that world and I was there as exploring that and trying to shadow OTs there and I saw ABA in practice I saw it working beautifully and I was like oh my gosh what is this I want to learn more about this and everyone I talked to was really passionate about it and had a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. So um, that kind of pushed me into that direction. And that's where I've been ever since. And how long have you been doing this now? I've been doing it since 2011. So um, what, 12 years, 12 years. Yeah. 12 years. Yeah. So over a decade. So <clears throat> when you first started, you had an interest was it difficult to get the basics so that you could start applying the principles and in, in seeing a change in the way you communicated, not only with autistic, but with people in general? Yeah, I think I had kind of the best case scenario for my experience because I started working in it before I started going to school for it. So I had a really good opportunity to be able to do what Mike's doing now um, as my entry into the field and be able to do it every day and learn from the peers that had been doing it for years and, and do it that way. And then go back to school and learn all of the definitions, learn why I was doing it, where it came from, all of the research. So I think I immersed myself in it. And then I learned more about the why and the definitions and all the nitty gritty. Um, so I had a really cool experience. And I, I felt like that's probably the best way to do it. And which is exactly what Mike is doing right now. And he's living it with his son. So, so you, you really started with an experience before mm -hmm. you went into the theory, because I'm sure you've seen people in many fields that are masters of the theory, but when it comes to practical application, they're more like professors than practitioners. So they can sound brilliant, but maybe not be effective unless you just need a talking textbook. Yep, you got it. And we say that in our field all the time. We have this really big exam to become a certified behavior analyst. And you can tell which people are really good at the exam knowledge and which people are really great clinicians, which I think is common across most fields. Yeah, it, it is. I think it's common in medicine. There's there's many mm -hmm. brilliant people that get into medicine that aren't really good with people. And I think they call it bedside manner, right? That's what the term has been. But what it really means is they they aren't in touch with the human being that they're treating, even though they have all the technical knowledge and probably technical skill to execute on that. So the point of what we're hitting on today that I think is so powerful with all the changes we're having in the world, 
and, and it's upside down. AI has turned the world around. The collapse of the financial system is turning the world around. The, the things that are going on with the dollar, the government, the amount of money we borrowed, people talking and fighting about climate. You can get to a point where you feel like it's hopeless. So mm -hmm. how do you help someone get off the hopeless train and back into the world where we can affect ourselves and others for a positive change? Yeah, great question. Um, I think we spoke about this a little bit in our, our pre-chat, but behavior analysis looks at behavior in a lens of what's making this happen and less of the reactionary, oh my gosh, you're doing this bad thing. I'm, I'm going to yell at you or reprimand you. It's more of turning that part of your brain on that's saying, okay, all of human behavior across every human um, the population of autism. Um, I, I was telling you, I use it with my husband. I use it with my kids. I use it across the board. Um, what is maintaining that behavior? So can I do something or modify something in the environment to, to change that behavior and change it for a long lasting effect rather than looking at it and saying, oh my gosh, this is happening. It's hopeless. I give up. I don't know what to do. I've exhausted all of my options. Um, so looking at it from a different lens. So is it common then for autistic children because of how they process the inputs from the world to feel overwhelmed, probably beyond what most people could even comprehend? Is that common? Yeah. And I think looking at families too, and Mike probably could speak to this better than I can, but I think we see more, more hopelessness and more, I don't know what to do, throwing my hands in the air with families and with caregivers, because autism is scary. You don't know. Um, a lot of times, if your child can't communicate to you, you don't know what they're thinking, what they're feeling. Um, you don't, it might feel really hopeless that you don't know how to help get them through whatever that tough time is. So I think just understanding that and empathizing with that, but also offering some, court, some sort of problem solving where, hey, doesn't matter if they have autism, doesn't matter what the hard time is. It's all human behavior, and we can help you work through that. So when you look at autism, is there enough known about why one child has it and one doesn't, and why people are on various parts of what's called the spectrum, how severe it is or how functional they are? I mean, it, does anyone even, do we scientifically understand why, what's happening? And why are no. we noticing it more now than we did when I was a kid? Yeah, that's the golden question, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'd, I'd be a quadruple billionaire if I could answer that question. Um, I think that there's been a lot of research looking at that. Um, and just being totally transparent with you, I think there's been some bad research too in the last 10-ish years that has come out and since been kind of refuted that says, oh, vaccines cause autism mm. for a while. I don't know, remember that. I and, since, that. Yeah. and since that came out, I might have frozen oh, up I'm for not. just a second. I think it did. Yeah. I think her internet was a little bit sketchy, so it might take a minute for her to come back okay. online. But while we're waiting for her to come back, yeah. and as we hear her speak, about that feeling of overwhelm that you might have experienced with your son where you knew something wasn't right and you did what you could to be a loving father and then sometimes you get frustrated he gets angry and you're mad at each other and then you feel bad how can i be mad at my son when he's how did you learn to deal with that that drive to anger out of frustration so that you could come back in and help him that was some of the hardest things so far that I've gone through as a parent was this and a lot of this happened before he got into ABA therapy um, his school and his IEP kindergarten was a was a major turning point for my son but prior to that there I, I mean there were so many times as a father as a parent like I just I just you know would just be in tears because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to be there for him. He can't, you know, he can't communicate to me what's wrong other than I don't know. 
and you know or he wouldn't say anything at all he would shut down and you're trying to and you know they can sense you frustrated you know and you're trying to like mask that and trying to stay calm trying to figure i mean there were a lot of lot of trials and tribulations with him especially when i realized the critical like how how important it was to get him onto key, key stru- routines and structures and even those were such difficult tasks to complete you know especially not having the experience you know other than i just have to stay consistent i just you know reminding yourself what going into this field has taught me um coupled with having my son you know having autism is that i lacked a lot of empathy and that's a skill that just doesn't happen overnight something that when you really want to work at. i feel that my empathy has come along a great ways because i think it's one of the biggest aspects besides being prop like having the problem solved um, you know, to this, I, I think it's a, it's a major piece and it, it really has like in itself, like helped me work on that, you know, so when, when you say empathy, me. when you say empathy and, and uh, Emma, you can probably uh, describe this uh, with your professional background is, is that the word thrown around a lot, but does it, it doesn't mean necessarily to, to be sympathetic, but more to right. have a sense of what it might be like to be experiencing what they're experiencing, be able to depersonalize it from an offense to you so that you get rid of the hostile combative feeling. And with enough practice, really good martial artists, really good fighters. You guys may already know this. The ones that win, they don't lose their temper. They continue right. when hostile things are occurring working through and what are they waiting for their opponent to make that one mistake and that's what determines a a tournament now that's a combat but aren't we often emotionally in combat with other people who are in combat with us i mean particularly in the fields you and i've been in mike how much combat do you see in finance and real estate i mean it's like a war right so i mean it's definitely a war i mean it's there's 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 everything was it all is fair in love and war i mean it's, it's 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 brutal Really so, is. so what we could say is, do you need help with an autistic child or a family member that's in mortgage banking or real estate? Mm-hmm. We can help you. I think we could probably go down to that path. Huh? <laughs> so, Emma, when you first met Mike, uh, was it your job to train him? Uh, are you a trainer, if that's a proper or a teacher? Um, in a sense, I guess. So he went through a whole training program. But um, I was one of his supervisors, so he worked with a child that I was supervising. And that child was his, or he worked nope. with another no. child. No. Nope. So, uh, so your son does your son also go to uh, this school or this training? So you go there as a as he, someone. He goes. He doesn't go to where I work. Uh, but he does have he does go to ABA therapy separately on his own. I'm just there's a conflict of interest. They don't want allow you to work at the same place you're so I, I wouldn't be able to you know work with him officially um you know but uh, yeah he, he, that's been you know his aba therapy i think has been his biggest his big his biggest step um you know in the right direction for him on top of other things but um yeah you know so you've seen a reduction in his frustration Maybe that's a simple way to put it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, it, where we were even three years ago to where we are like today is just night and day, like night and day. Um, you know, we're, he's learning to process his emotions. He's genuinely, he's so sweet and gentle. One of the things that, you know, that we have to work with my son is that like when he does, like if he accidentally, he's so big for his age, he's like the size of a 12 year old um, that like, he may accidentally hurt a kid that he's playing with like completely unintentional and there's nothing really even happened to the child. My son will take so offense. Like he has, you know, he's crying so hard, you know, and every, like it takes a whole, even the child that he hurt is coming over trying to say it's okay. You know, he takes these things so personally. So, you know, just him working through his emotions, you know, that's been a big thing that's come a long way. I think the ABA, has helped them with that so much because I see it with our own clients, you know, like it's one thing when you have a son going and having it done and seeing it, but I see it because I implement it, you know, with others, um, you know, and I see what, where they've come and where I, where we started, you know, it's been, 
and it keeps you going there. We talked about it the last time that ability to help others and you watching them succeed. is just an amazing feeling when you're seeing even small tasks that they couldn't do before and then challenging them to even go above and beyond and, you know, make these extremely, antiquated tasks for fun and seeing them accomplish it. You know, it's, it's incredible. You know, something just occurred to me while we're talking. I think of the times in my life when I've been least effective and it's when I was trapped inside my own head. And so I was self-referencing the problem I was running in my head. I was not empathetic. That's not the way that I was built. And I would spend my energy manipulating people rather than to try to partner with them to improve. Uh, You mentioned, uh, Emma, in your family that you found the skills you have picked up in this training you've applied to your family. Can you share with our audience what practical applications of that might be? Yeah. So I think the biggest piece here, and I may be going too far into like behavior analytic language, but there are four things that maintain behavior. Attention escape from something automatic. I like to do it and um, access to something. So if I'm looking at my own kids, I think it's been a skill that I have used since they were babies. Um, And I've, I also do with my husband, but you know, he's boring. So (laughs) um, if husbands are actually less challenging than children, is that what you're saying? Oh, you know, no, don't tell him I said that. (laughs) Don't be honest with me. (laughs) Okay. Uh, And I actually, that's a good point. I think that he sees me do some of these things in practice and he's picked up on some of them and he's like, oh my gosh, you're you can't do that. You're reinforcing their behavior. You're reinforcing that bad behavior. You can, you have to do this to, to reinforce the good behavior. And I'm so proud of him when he says that. But um, I think just looking, like I was saying earlier, through that lens of, okay, what of those four things is maintaining this behavior? And like Mike was saying, looking empathetically, and that's a skill. That's totally a skill that you have to practice. You have to maintain, you have to use it to be able to use it. So, so let's, let's stop here for a moment. Since I had such a difficult time with it, Mike said he did. Uh, you're so empathetic. It just seems like you were born that way, but you probably practice more than Mike and I have. I'm just thinking. <laughs> so he has a very natural sense of it. I'll tell you that. But she so really does. She so what is it that people in our audience can do that's not complicated to start the practice of empathy without feeling overwhelmed? Yeah, I think that exactly what I was saying. I feel like it might be too simple to even recognize that that's something you can do, but looking at it as looking at any behavior, good, bad, in between as what's maintaining it instead of reacting to it. I think we live in a very reactionary world. So for anyone listening at home, the principles of behavior, the easiest way to step into it and to to practice your empathy and learn to start living that way would be, okay, what's maintaining this behavior instead of reacting to it? So uh, when we react, and that becomes patterned response. They trigger something, we react. We actually become a part of the reinforcement of them continuing with what uh, you would call it dysfunctional, but inside of them, it's a function of defending themselves. And then we're defending ourselves until you have that combat situation. So are there exercises that you can practice when you're not under stress? Because once you're in stress, it's more challenging to think more kindly because you get into that defending mode. So what practice can someone have ahead of time? So when they get struck with that, oh, I feel that feeling, or they're getting ready to be angry and they think, let's do this for a minute first. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it'll be different for everyone. And maybe Mike, you can talk about what you do with your son, but I always try to think ahead of time of, okay, I'm not going to get into a battle of arms of like, it's me versus you and someone has to win. So a lot of times it's not anyone winning. It's just figuring out how to move forward and how to, how to, I guess, best work through it to not get into that situation again. So I think the best mindset going into anything before you get to that elevated level where you're, you're angry or you're upset is to say, no one has to win. It's okay. It's not a battle. 
it's not me versus you and you have to calm down or I have to be right. It's okay, let's work through it together. And how can we get to the other side? And do you find that, how old are your children? Five, seven, and nine. So when they're in the hyper state of ab reaction, whatever may have caused it, probably if they were away from you, it could have been building all day and now they bring it into the house, right? And you get to experience the, it's like the experience of uh, someone that comes home after a bad day and kicks their dog. You know, you've seen that scenario <laughs> play out in life. and The dog's looking at them like, what? <laughs> I was happy to see you. <laughs> what? What's going on? <laughs> so when they come in and they're I would, uneven, let's call it uneven, right? When they're yeah. uneven, do you, because you're so used to them, do you notice this unevenness? And have you learned, okay, when this one is that way, this is the best way for me to try to guard, even them back out again? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not perfect. I still yell. I still get upset. Um, but I do know when it's time to step away and like, okay, we are battling. We are going head to head. My nine-year-old, the worst. But um, he's just like me. So I know that he's going to come into the battle with the same things that I'm bringing to the battle. And sometimes the answer is just let's both walk away. Let's go our separate ways for a little bit, muster in our anger, and then come back and we can work through it. So because yeah, think- when you get upset, your your body is flush with chemicals. Mm-hmm. You might as well have had a drink or taken a shot or something. Your body is flush with chemicals. So the question is, are you going to run with those chemicals? And the more you run with them, what happens? The more chemicals release, your brain starts saying, hey, I felt like this before. Here's the 32 other times I felt that way. And it stacks and you get worse, right? You get worse. So what I heard you say, you feel the chemicals building, even though you don't call it that maybe, right? Call it anger, frustration. You think, you know what? No more talk right now. Let's take a break. It's not resolved, but let's just... Let the chemicals calm down, and then let's come back and revisit how we resolve this together. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Yep. And I think with kids, too, it's important to remember their brains aren't developed. So we might go into that conversation with, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you did this. Why would you do that? And their their poor brain is telling them something else, or maybe they can't control it, or their brain isn't telling them anything. So I think that's a big piece for parents too, just stepping back and being like, okay, my kid's only nine or five or seven. Um, their brain may be functioning differently than mine right now. And the statement that you made, you still yell, you still get angry. You still react in a way that you don't really want to. So the question isn't, does that ever happen? The question is how long do you allow yourself to stay there much more even to let it build as I described earlier? So have you learned to catch yourself sooner? You do that thing, you think, oh man, that's not the way I want to be. And you start calming yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I'm not perfect. I yell more frequently and for longer times than I want to. Um, But yes, I can definitely catch myself or we have, my husband and I have a really good system of, okay, I need to tap out. And that's literally what we say. Tap out your turn, which... I know not everyone has that luxury, but if you have a friend or even if your tap out means I'm going to go to my room or I'm going to go outside and get some air um, and leave my kid in a safe place, then yeah, that's what works for us. I think that's sound advice. Uh, You had mentioned that uh, Mike's experience with his son, it might be helpful for him to describe to us how he did develop that empathy and it not only helped him with his son, but of course, also with uh, his life in general. Mike, you, you want to share a little of that with our audience? I mean, you know, for me, I, I coming, you know, as a, as a, from my police background, you know, I felt like I, I lost some empathy, you know, along the way, you know, um, just from the areas that I had to work in and stuff like that, some of the stuff that you saw, you know, and then, uh, then I had my son, you know, and then, you know, I started to realize that I'm seeing myself in him. And what that felt like for myself when I was his age, you know, and so I knew right away that I was going to have to be a certain way. And, um, you know, and I'm not perfect. And in the beginning, it was very frustrating. I mean, there was some yelling and screaming. You know, I hate doing that. I always felt bad, you know, because I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what, how to help, you know, him and, 
my son's loud and with his emotions, you know, and he's such a big kid, you know, even at like one, two years old, he's just dies and four, six year old, you know, we're throwing golf balls through the front windows before the age of two, you know, that's that. And that was just for fun, you know? So, um, you know, I had to really, for me, it was more like mental reminders, like how I, when I would be in a situation to constantly keep reminding myself and I even do it to this day, whether it's on a business call, a tough call, whether it's at work and I'm having, and I'm struggling with one of my clients, you know, and I, I've had to come to Emma. I mean, she knows that there are times that, that I feel that I'm over my help and I need a help and I, I need help, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm reaching my limit and, um, and I don't want something to happen. So not with me, but I just don't want anything to happen with our clients. So, you know, I've had to do that with my son and, 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 and picking and choosing your battles. I mean, we even do it at work, you know, um, it's a dance, you know, it really is. It's an ebb and flow. And, you know, earlier on, it was harder, but as I've learned to be able to ebb and flow with my son, I've learned to be able to do that at work, both my works, you know, um, I, it's been a slow roll, but it's, it's a snowball effect because it's getting stronger and stronger, faster and faster as I've been building it. Um, but, but I breathing techniques is another one that I still use. I talked about that, I think, last time. You know, there's just different things that I kind of go to to help me, you know, work through these situations and help put myself in their shoes. You know, I guess that's why it's a common statement. Take a deep breath, because literally yeah. it changes your physiology. It really does. Yeah. You know, I like to see Emma yell and scream because that is definitely not someone. You know, well, I was looking like, at her. She what? looks so sweet. I was trying to put that <laughs> I mean, picture together in my mind as well. Like a Jekyll and I, I am like, <laughs> Yeah, like because I work with her and I'm trying to imagine like this other side. I just, I just can't. I can't. I can't see it. Like even the way she's probably describing it to her. I'm sure it's yelling and screaming, but I'm sure if I were, I'd probably be like, I'd laugh. You know, I'm saying like, you know, but like, I'm just kidding. You know, I'm just kidding. But, you know, but I mean, because you're so nice, you know, I just don't see, I can't see it. Like, you know, I just don't. But um, I mean, I get, I mean, that part's hard, you know, but learning how to tap out, I don't want to have to go to battle over and over again, especially if we're beating a dead horse, you know, in any situation, you know, sometimes it is best to just, like she said, tap out, walk away. Have to sometimes and just use what you have around you to do it. Yeah, normally, if you, if you imagine, an anger or a frustration or when you're to the point where you're shaking your fist at someone that pulled out in front of you on the freeway, as if that really matters. The, the question is, where did that come from? Right. It's been building up before they pulled out in front of you. So are there things uh, that we can do, Emma, with your training and background to notice things that we're reacting to early in our day before we're even in and around other people talks we're having in our head so that we're, our fuse is already short. Now someone's just themselves and we're taking out on them a fight we've been having inside of ourselves. Is there something, a practice that you've learned to teach? Yeah, I think um, the better question would be looking at the other end of that. So what brings me back down? So if you know, and you can recognize that you're angry or you're escalating, I think knowing like Mike was saying, breathing techniques, or maybe you're a person that just needs alone time. Maybe you're a, a snack or a drink or whatever your vice is that brings you back to earth. Um, I think practicing those things when you're not escalated makes it a lot easier to have muscle memory and bring you down a lot quicker when you are escalated. So maybe you're sitting in traffic and that one person pulls out and you know, you're getting angry, practice your breathing then before you get super angry and before you get too escalated and then just kind of build up from there. So it's a, it's, it's learning to pay attention to yourself and noticing when you feel like you're going out of balance and then have pre practiced things, you know, to do when that occurs, you see professional ball players, they do the same thing all the time, right? People that shoot baskets or hit balls with a the bat, they have a routine preparing to perform at their peak. So routines, breathing is a good one. Uh, getting away sometimes is a good one. Maybe having a, a drink, hopefully not of alcohol during the course of the business day, but maybe just a drink of water. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> How is that one for, for an idea? <laughs> so are there any other things that pop to your mind that you use, Mike, especially as a police officer? I mean, we all have seen police officers that are angry 
probably because of the life that they're living, trying to enforce on people that look at them as an enemy <laughs> instead of as someone that's helping them. Different outlets. You know, there was a period of my life where I was working that I just, I hated my life. I hated going into work because I knew that I was going to be dealing with horrible things. And it was just becoming, what was my problem was, is that I was becoming numb to everything. That if I got dispatched to a guy, or, you know, three men walking into a gas station armed with assault rifles, I was just like, okay, like nothing bothered, nothing scared you, nothing bothered you. And that bothered me, you know, that started to bother me, um, you know, and so I had to find different outlets, you know, law enforcement has such high statistics in such bad areas, divorce, drug use, alcohol abuse, I mean, physical, domestic violence, there's just, and a lot of it has to do with the stresses of the job. And I'm not trying to make that excuse because we right. still have to hold, hold ourselves accountable for our actions. Um, but those stats just don't lie, you know, so I knew that going in and especially in the areas that I was working on for a lot of my career that I needed to find different outlets. So the gym was always and to this day, an extremely important place for me. Um, it's not, it's, it's for where I can set and prepare my day or to escalate my day. It's where I can take my frustrations collectively. I like to go trail walking a lot. I find myself being very active, go take my dogs. Like for me, when I'm, when I'm starting to feel this way or a different, like, you know, or these different situations, you know, occur, even if my son frustrates the living heck out of me, you know, it's one of those days where everything's just out of rhythm, you know, you find different ways to change it up. I think that's the other thing that helps me is just change it up. And I, I, I learned that real quick before I started, you know, getting into ABA, cause I do it with our own clients. Sometimes we got to change it up. And I learned that from Emma and everything like if we're in a certain pattern, we got to take them out of that pattern and bring them back into a different pattern, you know, the one we want. And I can do that for myself. I can do that for my son. Like if he's having a very frustrating day, if I can't get him to do simple things, let's go, let's go accomplish something else randomly. It could be, I'll just think of something just random just to take him out of that moment. And I can do that for myself. I, I try to take myself out of that moment as fast as I can so that I can come back and move forward again it's that dance it's that balance you know that ebb and flow so different outlets for me that were constructive i'm lame i like jigsaw puzzles i know it, i mean so i'll step away and start working on a jigsaw puzzle and just sit down and breathe my son's in his room drawing i'm gonna work on a jigsaw puzzle we'll come back and we'll meet in the middle there for a second usually he's got to draw and he's got to bring pictures down and i can tell in his demeanor already he's back to normal again He's already curious to see what I'm working on. Next thing you know, we're doing our own jigsaw puzzle. So, and this all started, you know, from something else, you know, and so you just find a way, you know, it's, it's just a different little paths and very, you know, variances that you have to take also helps. Just found those things to be, to be helpful for me. I'm, I'm hearing over and over a theme here uh, for all of us. It's, it's realizing that uh, you know you behave in ways that you yourself don't like. Set aside whether other people dislike it. That's another complexity. So all of us have learned to recognize, maybe at an earlier stage than we used to, when we're starting to get those kinds of feelings that we found to be counterproductive and have learned practices to diffuse that earlier. And then the empathy piece I, somewhere over the last five years, I actually began to have a perception of what someone else might feel like in the situation they were in. Now, for me to do that, I had to think if that was happening to me, based on what they said, how would I feel? And here's something interesting that happened accidentally. I'd have people screaming at me and I would say, well, you know, that's interesting. If that had happened to me, I'd be really mad. I mean, I'd be way madder than you. And they would stop talking. They would stop talking because I was telling them they weren't mad enough. You're not mad enough for what happened. I'd be madder than that. It sounds so silly, but I do it all the time now. And it always causes people to calm down. Maybe they still have to blow off a few more explosions, but eventually they calm down. Emma, is there something in your training that's, that's like what I described? Or is that just something that's peculiar to me? Um, I don't know. That might be peculiar to you. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, if it works, see that's that's the beauty of behavior, though, right? If it works, then that's that's great. Yeah, I guess that's my uh, going to the gym, which I I do, or but it's a, something I found. For, whatever happens in my head that allowed me to do that is probably what causes me to calm myself down, rather right. than maybe what I described. So, have you found with autistic kids and people in general, they often can't really describe what's going on. You could ask them what's wrong and. Yeah. They don't know. Have you found that to be the case? 
or what they tell you isn't what's wrong. It's something else. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So do yeah. you have when do you recognize their demeanor and you think, OK, I, I heard that, but it doesn't really seem like that's the problem. Do you do you have that sense? Have you developed that? Do you teach that? Yeah. And I think Mike is a great example of this. He works with some of our most difficult kiddos um, and he has built relationships with them to the point where I think he knows like, oh, today's going to be a good day. Oh, today's going to be a bad day. Or this is his trigger. So, you know, he's doing this thing. I better watch out and make sure he's safe. I'm safe. Um, but yeah, I think you you build in working with the population of autism. You build in that innate sense of looking closer into their communication style um, and thinking when we're, we're talking to other adults, typically neurotypically developing adults like us three here we're able to use our voices and say, this is what's making me mad, even if I'm yelling it. Um, but a lot of times those kiddos with autism don't have that ability to say, I'm mad because the room is too hot. Um, so they're gonna be using some other form of communication. Um, and that might look like, we call it problem behavior, but that might look like hitting you or throwing something or just yelling um, in general, and just being able to figure out, again, like I was saying, wrapping it back up to the beginning of our conversation, what's maintaining that behavior? What are you trying to tell me? Instead of saying, stop yelling, sit down. Oh my gosh, why are you doing that? You look at it from the lens of, okay, he's trying to say something. What does this mean? Um, so looking at it from that, that lens. I am so delighted that we've been able to get together today. Uh, every time I do a show, I learn something. Uh, the last show I did with Mike, uh, uh, I became better at running the show than I've ever been since I started it. And I, I showed the wow. show to, to friends and they said that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> they said, I've never seen you be like that. That Mike guy brought something good out in you. So I wanted to thank you for that. My ex-wife would probably thank you as well, but it's too late for that one, right? <laughs> I don't have to do that in the quantum. I don't know. <laughs> it's never too late. <laughs> <laughs> for that. So uh, as we wind down the show, uh, there's probably a couple of things. Those in our audience that are, are uh, in a family, that someone has autism, someone important to them, where can they go? in order to get some help and direction. Uh, Emma, you, you want to speak to that in general? Yeah, um, this is not a paid advertisement. This is literally what I tell everyone. And this is not the company Mike and I work for, but in Michigan, we have this great resource called the Autism Alliance of Michigan. Um, they have care advocates. So you fill out their contact form. They, they place you with an advocate that is specific to you. And you can ask them for resources across the board. So respite care, health care, ABA services, other therapies, um, job coaching, anything that you might need in your geographical area and by funding source. So whether you have insurance coverage, private pay, um, Medicare, things like that. So in Michigan, I know you're not from here, but we have an amazing resource system here. So there must be in every state, some may be better than others, at least a resource like you described. Now, for someone that wanted to uh, use your company, the one that you and Mike work for, uh, if they're in an area where that would work, how can they reach out to you and uh, see if they can apply or go through the process, whatever that looks like? Yeah. So you caught us in a weird time. Um, the company we work for is closing, <laughs> ah. which... Might actually, I think this would be a great conversation to have um, with some top ABA executives in the business, but we're a private equity funded business and we're closing our doors. Um, and I think that's a bigger conversation that you may want to look into. But again, if you are looking for specific ABA services, um, I would talk to your pediatrician, check out the Autism yeah. Alliance of Michigan. And wherever you got your diagnosis, they should be providing you a document with whatever resources are in your area. So, Emma, we talked about this uh, pre-show. We always want to leave our listeners with hope and opportunity. As a favorite of mine that I quote Dr. Dozer Spenza says, 
brilliant opportunities are often disguised as impossible situations, but there's always a door. So with that thought in mind, for those in our audience that may be experiencing an impossible situation that doesn't seem like a brilliant opportunity, what would you recommend to them? What's something they can do immediately after this show that's easy to start down the direction that you and Mike have gone to not only help children with autism, but to help yourselves, your families, your friends and people in business? Yeah, I think we covered it a few times, but um, look at life and be human behavior as it's not a battle. I'm not here to win or lose. Um, what's maintaining that behavior and how can I how can I move forward from that? So I guess my tagline, it's not a battle. <laughs> okay, I like that. So it's not a battle. And then part of what I had said earlier, what's that other person thinking? How could they be like this? There must be something that do they just want to be mad at me? Or is there something would they rather not be mad, right? What's going on? And how can I understand what's making them mad? And in that process, learn myself, but help them. Maybe they don't have some of the things we talked about, the take a deep breath, go up to the club. They don't have that. So they're they're stuck. And maybe if we at that moment open a doorway for them to start developing those practices to diffuse themselves. Now that's something worth living for. Cause in conflict, you can find opportunity, even though at the moment it might not feel that way, huh? Well, I want to thank uh, you. The two of you are wonderful. I have enjoyed your company. I'll have to say, like you, you had mentioned, Mike, when I saw Emma, I thought, oh, my gosh, am I talking to a fairy tale princess or something? And then she starts talking. <laughs> and, she, and then she says the thing about being able to be angry. And I'm thinking, how could that be possible? So I had the same puzzle. So warning to the audience, just because they look sweet and wonderful, beware, <laughs> they can still bite. <laughs> Thank you very much, you as guests. Uh, please remember to give us a thumbs up and a thank you and send people to us that might like to be interviewed on this show. And I'd like to come back and do another show on what you talked about on getting funding for autism. There's a lot of people we know yeah. in the investment business. And if there's an economic opportunity to do good, that's a wonderful opportunity because you can put big capital behind something like that. Well, I want to thank everybody, one and all. Uh, look forward to seeing you uh, give us the thumbs up, give us the likes and subscribe. If you would like to bring a guest to the show, please let me know. And you guys all have a, uh, 